Hi Fountains Church, good evening. I'm recording this for the evening of uh, Friday Church on the 29th of January and I had to just check my notes because I just forgot what the date was. Um, so this is us carrying on in the book of Acts and we're at Acts 14 and I've actually given this one a title. I don't always give my, my messages titles as you know but I've called this one The Two Ditches. The two ditches beside the highway of the gospel. So, usual system, please take a break now, put me on pause and go and read Acts 14 together. If you're following up and watching this at another time, then you might be reading Acts 14 on your own. There's no rush. I can pause as long as you want me to. So take your time, go through the, the book of Acts 14. And if you haven't read Acts 13 for a while, it's worth actually reading Acts 13 again as well, so that to remind yourself, especially the last few verses. So I'll let you get on with that. Uh, just put me on pause and come back to me. So hopefully now you've read Acts 14 and you have a vague awareness of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to start actually right at the very beginning with verse 1, where it Really, this, this verse to me is just speaking to a preacher and it says they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. So as a pastor, as a preacher, this encourages me and this says that I need to uh, make an effort to teach well, to speak effectively. We know that um, a large part of effective speaking is when it's Holy Spirit led, but um. But actually, we do have a responsibility as well to craft our message well, to to make an effort to ensure that we are capturing the essence of what God is saying, even the specific words of what God is saying in a way that can be understood easily by other people. And that's why you see um, Paul, as he goes from area to area, sometimes appearing to change his approach in the way he communicates with people, because he's looking at how to communicate with that particular group at that particular time. But it's interesting that even in verse two, it says, but there were Jews who refused to believe. So even though Paul's message was clear and good and was effective and people came to faith, there were still Jews who refused to believe. Interesting, they didn't just happen to not believe, they refused to believe. They were provided with all the evidence they needed. Many others came to believing faith, but they refused to believe. And actually, as we launch Fountains Church and as we go and we tell people about Jesus, there will be people who believe and there will be people who refuse to believe. It's not our responsibility to make everyone believe. It really isn't. You know, the Holy Spirit will impress on some of them to respond in faith, but some of them will just completely block him won't want anything to do with him and that is their prerogative. God gave them free will and it's not our responsibility to take that from them. However much we might think it's a good idea to coerce or manipulate, the reality is that it's never a good idea to coerce or manipulate. That's always the devil's work. We provide them with the evidence, we teach well, we let the Holy Spirit do his part and then we celebrate when people come to faith but not everyone will. It's interesting, they chose not to believe. A little willingness on their part would have changed their eternity, but they refused. I'm a determined person. Everybody says that. In fact, some people use other phrases to mean the same thing. And being hard-headed can be really good if it creates a determination to obey God. And maybe they refuse to believe because their understanding of God told them that this wasn't accurate, that the gospel was against what they had been taught about God. But when our determination outweighs our discernment, it can lead to disaster. See, there's a good preachy phrase. I'm going to give you it again. When our determination outweighs our discernment, it can lead to disaster. They were determined. They refused to believe. They didn't discern that this was the gospel of truth, that this actually didn't contradict their teaching as Jewish people 
but actually supported it and fulfilled it. They didn't have the discernment for that. And so it led to disaster. Look what happens next. Verses three to five. The Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So the Jews who were determined not to believe associated themselves with the Gentiles, with people who normally they would just consider enemies. And they associated with them and turned against their own Jewish brothers. That sounds like the sort of thing that happened then, but you know, we still do this stuff today. Think about Christian believers in the United States over the past few years and very recently. Some of them, in their determination to fight for what is true, found themselves associated with people who had no respect for the rule of law or even for truth or even for the democratic process. But instead they turned against the very people the Christian believers would normally associate with and agree with. And the Christian believers' determination to stand up for what they believed to be right, well, it blinded them. They lost their discernment, their ability to judge a situation or even a spiritual influence on a situation or upon a person. And they couldn't tell what was behind it. And so they found themselves, or some of them found themselves, either supporting a very ungodly person in very ungodly behaviour or involved in a plot against good people. What a mess. So we go to verses 6 and 7. Paul and Barnabas found out about the plot against them. Now if we read back in chapter 13 in the verses 40 to 51, we can see that they had been expelled from Pisidian Antioch, having done exactly what God had called them to do. And when they entered Iconium, they did so with joy. And now they're under threat and they had to leave. When we feel that God has led us somewhere and used us there, it can be hard to leave. It can feel that maybe we've misheard God in the first place or that we keep coming up against barriers from people who don't want us. And, you know, we can see from Paul and Barnabas that although the persecution wasn't from God, God used it to keep repelling his good news into new areas. So what are the ditches, the two ditches at the side of the highway of God's calling for us to preach the gospel? Well, I think the first ditch is doubt. The doubt that says, did God send us? If it's God, why do we keep hitting barriers or facing persecution? And how do we deal with doubt? Well, we ask God for discernment. What's really going on? And we look for the pattern, not just for the negative, but for the positive too. We look for his confirmation. What signs have you had? that he has been leading you all the way through. Paul and Barnabas, just look at what they went through for a minute or two. In, verse, in chapter 13, verse 45, they have jealousy and abuse. In verse 48, many believed. In chapter 13, verse 50, they have persecution. God moved them on. Verse Chapter 14, verse 1, many believed. Verse 3, signs and wonders. Verse 5, persecution. God moved them on. Verse 10, healing. And so we come to the second ditch. Pride. From a whole pattern of serving God more and seeing him do things and then escaping persecution and then again serving God and seeing him act and then escaping persecution, the disciples could easily have slid into doubt or despair. Logic might have told them, logic, might have told them that God was very much with them. They've seen salvations, they've seen healings, they've seen signs and wonders. Or logic could tell them that God wasn't really protecting them as much as he might. They've had persecutions, they've had plots, they've had death threats. Or it could actually tell them that actually they were very important. When we're human, which, you know, we are, sometimes we fight our own way out of doubt and insecurity. And instead of relying on and trusting what God is saying and showing us, 
we start to create our own story of why things are happening. Oh, well, the people are jealous. Well, that's true. Verse 45 said that. Oh, well, they can see God is tr using us. That was true. Oh, and, and we know he's chosen us for this work. Well, that was true. So obviously we are something special. Not true. You see how it develops? We take a truth and a truth and a truth and we extrapolate. We take two and two and two and make 47. You know, it's often the most insecure people who will end up in this pattern. They can't understand why God would use them. Their logic tells them that God only uses special people and they know that they're failures and they make mistakes over and over. So they end up in this strange balance where they are both insecure and feel inferior, but also have a superiority complex at the same time. Their heart and their emotions tell them that they're not good enough to be used by God, but their head tells them that since they are being used by God, they must have something special. They must be something special. And that's when you hear people proudly boasting about how humble they are. They can't even see the irony. Maybe I've done it myself. A plank in my eye, distorting my vision. When Paul and Barnabas got to Lystra, they were hailed as gods. Not God, his people, gods. Not that they were God's men, but they were hailed as gods. They were celebrated and people wanted to worship them as if they were gods. People saw how God used them and they interpreted that according to what they already believed. You know, we always interpret things based upon what we already believe. It takes a just a quantum shift to dare to believe something completely new. When I was a new believer, I, I took a friend to church and I wanted her to experience um, the worship and, and God's presence in the church that I was saved in. And she came to church with me, but she came to church believing it was a cult. And she sat in the congregation and went through the whole service, exactly the same service I experienced, exactly the same moving of God upon the congregation, the ex ex exactly the same incredible worship experience, in incredible sense of connection with God, exactly the same hearing people speaking in tongues and hearing people prophesy and seeing God do amazing things. And she came out of there and declared we were all mad and we had all been in a trance. See, her expectation was that we were in a cult. So she then interpreted what she saw based upon that expectation. When people come to church, whether it's online or whether it's in, in reality, in the room we're in, in, in physical room, online is real as well. We need to explain what we're doing in church. We need to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it, especially things that they don't do outside of church, like communion and like the use of the gifts of the spirit. We need to explain those things. We don't really need to explain how a chair works. They know those things. But we need to explain why we use communion to symbolise something that happened 2,000 years ago. We need to explain what the bread and the, and the juice actually are and what they are not because there is so much confusion there. We need to explain the gifts of the Spirit. We need to explain what they are and what they are not. And I'm going to be doing some teaching to save online regarding those so that that's a resource for us to come back to. But when they're in use in a church meeting and there are people there who are not believers who don't understand this stuff, it's just far too easy for it to be misinterpreted. So we must explain. And that's what happened with Paul and Barnabas when these men saw God use them to heal. They interpreted it that they themselves were doing the healing. But Paul and Barnabas, they sidestepped the second ditch, the ditch of pride. They did not accept all the gifts they could have received if they'd gone the way of pride. But you know, there are many Christian believers and many Christian leaders and churches who either teeter on the edge of this ditch or just fall straight in. What incredible blessings we can call them. What incredible 
um, lifestyle and experiences we can have when people worship us a bit, when people think we're the amazing ones, when people have a hero worship or an admiration for us that makes them lavish praise and money on us. And it's easy to interpret that and say, oh, God is blessing me. God is blessing me for my faithfulness. But when worship is involved, when people are worshipping us instead of God, we'd better make sure we don't accept it. And we'd better make sure we don't look for that. We don't look for human accolade. Far better to be persecuted than to be worshipped. So having avoided the, uh, the ditch of pride, things turn around again and trouble is whipped up from them again and Paul was stoned. And it implies that it's almost to death. Or is it actually to death and he is raised? It's difficult to tell. You know, doing God's will does not prevent persecution. In fact, it almost guarantees it. But we must be careful and not presume that perceived persecution is actually against God. You know, if we're being unwise or thoughtless or confrontational, strong ne negative response might just be a natural response to us saying something the wrong way. Now, I am guilty of this. I can often say things a way that isn't easy for people to receive. And God has done a work in me, but I'm not perfect and I am not finished yet. Not all of the negatives we receive are persecution against God in us. You know, if we stink, people will recoil from us. So having dodged the two ditches which run alongside the highway of obedience to God, having dodged um, doubt and having dodged fear, Paul and Barnabas encourage the disciples in Lystra, Iconium and Antioch. What is their encouragement? Well, it's not an easy gospel. In, in this chapter 14, in verse 22, the second half of the verse, so we call that 22b, they say we must go through many hardships. Now, forgive me, but I don't find this particularly encouraging on the surface of it. It actually looks like a terrible discouragement. Great, we've got to go through hardships. Yay, that's wonderful. Why is it encouraging? Well, it's not a false promise that everything will be promised, that everything will be easy. You know, false promises discourage us because if we're told that everything will be easy and then it's not, then it's hard. We somehow think that then it, it must be our fault. We must be getting something wrong if it's hard. And, you know, instead of doing that, they're saying, yes, it is really hard sometimes. They've come back to these towns telling them of the persecution they've had and of Paul being stoned and all of the problems they've had, but they're also saying, but look, people came to faith, people were healed. Amazing things happened. So they're saying, yes, it is really hard, but God is with us. They're saying, be of good courage. You're not unique in having struggles and nor are you alone within them. Now this speaks to Fountains Church on this week in January in 2021 because this week one of you called me and well messaged me and said I'm I'm struggling with this thing can we have a call and I called and I called and admitted that I was struggling with that thing too and I don't know it if I'd even been able to put words to it yet but because they called or they spoke to me I was able to say gosh yeah me too and we've been talking, haven't we, about being not unaware of the devil's um, tricks against us and the way he does things and attacks so subtly sometimes. But because they called and we spoke, then we were able to pray into that. And kind of halfway through praying, suddenly I'm just getting fired up and I'm telling the devil he has no right in this area. The encouragement was that we weren't alone in a struggle. 
that you know and we could identify it and we could see what was going on because it wasn't just us I don't know how long it would have taken me to come out of that if they hadn't messaged me and I don't know how long it would have taken them to come out of it either but God had us speak to one another the encouragement is knowing that we're not alone in it not only are we not the only one having this struggle and we have comrades we have friends we have fellow believers who are experiencing similar battles at similar times but also God is with us in it and we can pray and we can get confidence within it that he is with us we can get support we can have his comfort even while we are in it so what did they do they didn't give false promises they did accept that things were really hard sometimes but that God is in it and then they committed people into leadership after encouraging them to trust God in the struggles Our job as a church is to encourage each other. Yes, sometimes it's really hard. Yes, sometimes I don't really understand what's going on, but God is with us. That's the encouragement. And we should be daring to say this to each other. None of us needs to pretend that we understand exactly what's going on all the time. That's his job. That's not my job. It's not your job. It's his job. We need to not slide into the ditch of pride that says that I've got to pretend I'm always on top of everything that's happening and always have exact discernment and exact understanding. I've been in churches led by people that pretend that, that carry this air of holiness and superiority and, and knowledge and perfection, but we're not perfect, are we? So our job is to encourage each other, but also our job is to guard our own hearts and the hearts of others. We need to help each other with doubt and we need to guard our own hearts against pride. Everything we do successfully as Christian believers and as a church is all done by God and with God. Doubt tells us that it's not God at all. Doubt lies. Pride tells us that we don't need God. Pride lies. Let's not look to our own fears or to our own strengths and abilities. In the words of Hebrews 12 too, let's look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And in the words of Deborah Lynn, just think about this. Jesus overcame both doubt and fear sorry, doubt and pride on the cross. If he'd doubted God, he would have backed out at Gethsemane. And he said, not your will, but mine. I trust you. I don't doubt what you're going to do. It's going to be hard, but I trust you. I do not doubt you. And if, if he'd had pride, then when he was on the cross, he would have commanded the angels to save him. Look who I am, pride would have said. Instead, back to Hebrews 12, I quote, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's be like Jesus.